Hello everybody, the Army of Light Earth Division, the boots on the ground. It's Shauna L. Francis and today is August 6th, 2024. Thanks for joining us team for the Decoding the Living Word. It's the Bible series with none other than Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek who actually claimed to have written uh, the book of Moses or Genesis and also the book of Revelation. And they've probably written all kinds of other things in the Bible, but we're not uh, quite to that point yet. <laughs> we're starting off here at the very beginning with Genesis. Um, this is our second Decoding the Living Word series, and we're basically starting up with Genesis chapter 4 and talking about Seth and a little bit more about the serpent and the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> My name is Shauna L. Francis. I am a conscious channel. I am channeling Melchizedek. I have 400 or so videos on this YouTube channel. We've channeled everything from the Galactic Federation of Light to Bashar and Cryon onto Melchizedek really pretty exclusively for the last couple of years. It has been one heck of a journey team and it's been just wild and crazy the last couple of weeks. Thanks everybody who's new to the channel. Um, YouTube served this video up here, this channel up a couple weeks ago when it came to the, um, I guess it's only been a week, uh, this whole shakeup in the upper realms with Melchizedek after they had told me they could no longer be my main guides and we could no longer do all the things that we had planned and I was being assigned new guides. I wasn't having that. I absolutely freaked out. I wrote a big letter that got circulated to uh, the powers that be. And we got this whole thing reversed. And in the meantime, we were able to drum up even more support for what we're doing as light workers here on the planet, particularly us who are, uh, we've taken uh, the reins on helping to alert humanity to the negative reptilian regimes, manipulation of humanity since pretty much the beginning of our time here on the planet. So um, this is not for the faint of heart. These are um, cutting edge topics, even though the likes of David Icke and others have brought this kind of information forward before. It is part of my personal karmic balancing, my oversold, my monad, monads, oversouls, um, karmic balancing to bring this information forward to the masses. I've been a channel for Mel Melchizedek for many lifetimes and um, you know, we are starting to move more toward being part of this galactic community and our voices are beginning to be heard. Our plight here and the density that we're dealing with and the challenges, the unique challenges that we face here um, is really starting to get more visibility on the other side of the veil. So this is only going to be good for us. And we've got about 400 new subscribers in the last week. So I'm just so thrilled about this. Thank you for being here. Um, Melchizedek has been talking about bringing forth, you know, the true, the truth of the Bible, a lot of the concepts and the symbolism there um, for a while now. And finally, now is the time. And this has been a bit of a bone of contention on the um, outer realms um, disclosure in general. You know, is humanity ready for this? Are we ready to know the truth? And you know, folks, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> so while we may be representing the tip of the spear, the spear is in motion, team. It is moving. It is swift. It cannot be stopped. We are going to land. This information is going to make it out to the masses eventually. And in the meantime, we get to be the crazy folks who are talking conspiracy theories and, you know, making things up and being crazy and, you know, talking to false prophets and false guides and all that, you know, Use your own discernment. And if this this information is not resonating with you, that is completely fine. It is not meant for everybody. I mean, it is, uh, this is tough. And if I would have met me, you know, six, seven years ago before my awakening and I'd have heard myself talking the way I talk now about existence, I really would have thought this person's nuts. So I get that we are in kind of a unique situation here where we have a community of folks who are in alignment for the most part on the general belief systems around what's been going on here. You know, there are no textbooks out there that are going to talk about this. 
this is something that our guides are bringing forward. We're bringing forward through our past lives, through other incarnations, through remembrance, through hypnosis. Um, you know, the channeling has just been insane. Um, Melchizedek, since this whole fallout in the upper realms and then coming being reassigned back to me, um, has brought them closer than ever. Excuse me, frog in my throat already. For tonight's channeling around the Bible, I was basically in a trance. Um, so I'm a conscious channel and I'm embodied with Melchizedek, but I will tell you, like, they're putting me more in a trance state than I think I'd ever felt with them before while channeling. And I think because, you know, I'm pretty unfamiliar with the Bible, I'm learning along with some of you here what's in this book and um, how to interpret it, right? Um, and these interpretations have been, you know, really all over the place, depending on who you talk to and which church you belong to. And a lot of the important stuff's been removed from the Bible. Um, so I think it's just a matter of, you know, putting me in that trance to really allow me to let go and allow their words to flow. Um, and I know for some of you, if this isn't going to be enough, <laughs> uh, Melchizedek in the very beginning asked, you know, for your patience in terms of, you know, we're going to Kind of me meander around a bit. We're going to take our time with this. This will be several months of Melchizedek um, seeding consciousness with this information, and it and truly, it you know, it is a um, it's a resetting of our understanding based based on today's needs, where we are in this moment in our level of consciousness, knowing that we are in the last one thousand year stretch of this ascension process. This is specific to us here. This is new information coming through that hasn't been understood before because we are ready as a collective to begin to entertain these ideas. So this is really exciting and it's important what we're doing. How's everybody doing out there? Let me know in the comments. We do have a beautiful community here. If you're new, <laughs> you'll fit right in. Um, we're always respectful and loving and there's plenty of room for everybody's opinions. We just want to keep it heart-centered, okay? Um, and everybody's doing a really good job of that. All right. Genesis chapter 4. We're going to talk about Seth. And just a quick reminder before we get into this, um, two weeks ago we had our first series on this, Adam and Eve and the serpent and the eating of the fruit of the tree of uh, life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In a very simplified nutshell, Melchizedek says, this parable is about today. Eve, representing the divine femininity here on the planet. The serpent, representing the manipulative, slithering control of the negative reptilian regime here on the planet. The divine feminine saying, yes, I'm ready to know about this information. Eating of the fruit. Also, just the whole way the serpent has been positioned in the Bible to show you just how coercive they can be, how manipulative they can be, and how easy it is for us to succumb to that manipulation. This is happening on a mass scale, team, mass scale. Um, sharing that fruit with Adam. We are now ready to bring this information forward and share with the men, share with the rest of the planet. So it is a divine feminine leading the charge in helping to disclose the negative reptilian regime here, um, the knowledge of the the tree of good and evil is about learning about the negative reptilians here in a nutshell. Okay, so we're going to build upon that today. So I sat down today with Melchizedek to talk about the Bible. And uh, once again, team, I'm using a version of the Bible that has both, it's both the Old and New Testaments. And we are starting with Genesis. We've just barely gotten started here if you're new. Um, do go back and, and take a look at that last video if you'd like um, about Eve and Adam and the serpent. All right, so chapter four. They had me read through this once again. And I'm going to read some of this to you. And if you want to follow along in your own Bible, um, and I'll try to not be reading too much here, but enough to give you a flavor for what they're talking about. All right, um, chapter 4, verse 1 of Genesis. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. 
Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of the time of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So again, Abel being the shepherd, Cain being the one who's farming, working the soil. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Why, uh, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is couching out the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Uh, verse 8 here. Cain said to Abel, his brother, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. All right. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying from the ground, crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Okay, so I'll stop there for now. Sorry, and I'm probably not pronouncing some of these things correctly. So what they said, thank you, dear one, when I stopped there, they said, we have a parable whereby men are fighting men from the very beginning. All right, we're talking about Adam and Eve's children from the very beginning. What Melchizedek was trying to convey here is that right from the get-go, we had jealousy. We had anger. We have, we, you know, this is about good, good and evil on the planet, the slithering serpent, and what this all represents. Here we go. We're already fighting each other. We, you know, we've just witnessed a brother killing a brother over jealousy. All right, Melchizedek continues here. Cain, having been jealous of Abel's favor with God, would rather have killed his brother than lived with the jealousy. All right, and this is where my energy really went deep. And again, I'm feeling like I'm in a trance for this. Here's what Melchizedek said here. The story of Cain and Abel is an illustration of the ongoing rivalries of man against man, human against human. There are never winners in these situations only continuing one-upmanship, grudges that must be rectified, and this continues the cycle of divisiveness that is still so much a part of today's collective. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and became aware of the slithering serpent, the seductive manipulation of this force, losing oneself in the hatred and the anger. In turn, they lost touch with the tree of life, which represents Christ consciousness and the unity of all things. And it also represents an undercurrent of love as a motivator, a great motivator. Whereas the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents hatred, contempt, coveting, and related feelings of lack, unworthiness, feeling rejected, not good enough. All right. Cain, they said, striking down Abel, sets the tone for humanity, a species under duress. Passing down of this denser, more negative mindset from generation to generation. Chapter 4, verse 23. All right, so we switched gears and we jumped to 23 here. So, Cain had a son. Okay, Cain had many children, and I think their children had Lamech, and I'm not saying that right, Lamech, who had two wives, okay, and they had children. <clears throat> Verse 23 here, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Hearken to what I say. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech 
77-fold. All right, so already within this lineage of Cain's, there's more killing going on. Somebody um, wounded, wounded Lamech and he killed them. He just up and killed them. Okay, so here we go. Melchizedek to this. It is a parable, dear friends, and it sets the stage for a lust of a lust for blood, a lust for vengeance. Vengeance, the us versus them mentality that is so pervasive, losing touch with the undercurrent of love and the inherent connection between all. All right. And then we get into this idea of Seth coming up. And by the way, I have some Q&A at the end that I want to go through as well after we get through the channeling. All right. Verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. I'm just going into uh, chapter 5, verse 1 briefly here. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Um, verse 4 here, the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were nine. 130 years and he died. Okay. So here's what Melchizedek has to say about all this. Dear ones, regarding Seth, Adam and Eve bore another son, and the reason given was because Cain had slain Abel. But the real reason is that Seth carried some very important keys, some very important information, things that have been that, that have been hidden from humanity. Seth was a bringer of light. Seth tried to bring awareness to the plight of man. This plight being the separation from Christ consciousness and from the connection to source, their birthright of love and unity. All right, hidden from humanity. So perhaps in these translated Bibles and the final versions that came out, the information about Seth and his life removed. Okay. And he continues to talk about Seth and the original intention for Seth in this parable. Seth was a dreamer. Seth was very different. Seth came to the planet and didn't understand why there was such an angry stance among his brothers and sisters. A defiance almost. This lack of regard for each other and the suspicious approach to their neighbor, neighbors seemed to be the norm. And Seth couldn't understand this. Seth represents a sea change in consciousness where those who had accepted the anger, the suspicion, and the divisiveness as normal, he brought a different perspective, a new possibility for relating and for being in the world. Doesn't this sound familiar? Kind of what we're doing now? This has been going on a long time. All right, Melchizedek continues here. Seth's approach endured for a time, but only a short time. Throughout the stories, you'll see that there were many who were placed on the planet, seated, if you will, to help bring conscious awareness to the density, to bring a new point of view, a fresh take, a breath of light. His ability to do so were relatively short-lived, his ability was relatively short-lived, and you'll see this throughout these accounts. Those who carry an expanded consciousness and in more alignment with Christ's light, trying to open the eyes of their brothers and sisters, and being successful only for a small amount of time. That is the crushing hold of the serpent, they said. Seth's part in the Bible was brief, but we did want to make this known in this moment that this was his role. Yeah, I did a little bit of research on Seth, and you know, basically they, they just refer to these few passages that I read out loud, and and you know, really 
people got that he represented the light and that he represented kind of the, the lineage of Noah all the way down to Jesus. Um, all right. And they said, I, there was a long pause here. I said, is there anything else you want to bring forward for the video? And they said, dear one, this is as far as we'd like to go today. But of course, I had some questions. I said, okay, Melchizedek, can I please ask a question? They said, yes, dear one. I said, you stated that this was a parable in the beginning, but you know, there, you know, obviously there are really specific details in Genesis. Um, years that they were, how long they lived, each of their names, who they married, all the children. I said, it, it seems super literal and very specific. I said, so, but is it supposed to be taken literal, knowing what we've already spoken about in terms of humanity being seated here 200,000 years ago at Lemuria with the reptilian humanoids? So there's been many videos on this that I've posted that they've talked about this. This was a grand experiment having humanity placed here with the reptilian humanoids. And, you know, this experiment didn't go all that well. Um, I said, can you please be more clear on this? Were these real people or is this, are these all just symbols and concepts a parable? Thank you. And they said, thank you, Shauna. They said, it's a big question, dear one. We'll do our best to explain. And they took me so deep into a trance for this for whatever reason. All right, and here's what they had to say to this question. Dear ones, a lot of time and effort were put into the details of the creation story and Genesis in general. This was meant to be as believable as possible for those who would read the Bible over the past 2,000 years. It has served as a guiding light for those seeking a higher truth for the generations before all of you. It did its job to some degree. The, liter the literal nature of the writing was purposeful. The details crisp and important for those times. And they continue here. We have entered a new age, dear ones. It's a new era. A new understanding of humanity's creation is ready to be born. We wish to be very sensitive to those who hold these words so very near to the heart, so very close to their identities. We wish to not alienate any of you from the words within the Bible. We wish to only help shift consciousness to the greater understanding that is ready to be revealed now. They say here, we lament the end of the age of innocence. For the telling of the stories of the negative reptilian regime signifies the end of the age of innocence. The tree of life is ready for you all now. The kingdom of heaven is ready for you now. The trials and tribulations of these times require that perceptions here change, belief systems evolve, new knowledge is accepted, or at least entertained. Much like Copernicus hundreds of years ago in your linear Earth time frame, humanity is ready to go deeper. As always, dear friends, they said, we watch the field for your questions and for your concerns. We work together as partners on bringing forth this new understanding. We're very, very thankful to be working with you all at this level. And we are thankful for what you reflect back to us. It serves a great purpose. Okay, and that's basically where they ended that. All right, so keep your questions coming. Um, we're going to have plenty of time to make sure that everybody's answer questions are answered, I think, over the next several months. So just some patience as we get our groove going here, as I get my groove with them, with the Bible, and working in such a kind of more of a trance way with them. Um, it's so nice to have them back. I'm so ecstatic that this wasn't all ripped away from us. 
Um, and again, guys, I do want to publish parts of the letter that I wrote to the upper realms, the folks that, who are trying to make these decisions. Um, I do want to share, I don't want to share it on YouTube, but I do want to put it in an e-newsletter. I'm going to try to release this tomorrow. So if you want to sign up for my newsletter to get that, that'd be wonderful. Um, I'll put the link down below in the description. All right, guys, how are you feeling about these Bible disclosure videos so far? Um, interesting. Things are getting really interesting, right? And I would say kind of fun because we're really stepping more into who and what we are in truth. And with this knowledge of who and what we are in truth becomes, it, it comes a, a sense of peace and a sense of knowing that we are all here temporarily on this earth, but we are eternal souls of love and light. And we're here doing really important things. And it is keeping the peace and keeping the calm and holding the torches of love high in the middle of such extreme density and chaos, you know, especially in the U.S. as we get closer to the election. Um, you know, there's just a lot going on here. And I'm sure many of you could name many people in your world who are dealing with um, all kinds of crises and personal turmoil and major changes and transformations, transitions in their lives. You know, we get to be the calm and the steady and the chaos. We're riding that surfboard above the waves here. We're not getting pummeled by these waves. And this is important so because we are showing others that, yes, this is how you can actually carry yourself through these times. You don't have to buy into the misery. You don't have to watch the news 24-7. You don't have to feel terrible about what's going on in the world. Um, and it, it just feels quite liberating. You know, it's just, it's liberating. It's, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. <laughs> we're getting there, guys. We're doing this. We're actually doing this work. We're, and it's important. Okay, I'm going to leave it at this. It's been a heck of a week. I do expect to see you next week on Tuesday for the next installment of Decoding the Living Word. Thanks, team, for being here, and I love you. Mwah.